From bitter enemies to fast friends, two of Africa's longest standing rivals end their violent conflict, but will it last? I'm Maria Ramos, and today's newsmaker is the peace deal between Ethiopia and Eritrea. This week, we've been looking at Ethiopia and for the country's new leader, it's been an eventful six months. But to many, Abiy Ahmed's biggest achievement is signing a peace deal with Eritrea. Now, the two nations were at war for more than 20 years. Tens of thousands of people were killed. Families were forced apart and communications were cut. But now, after decades, some of those families have been reunited, embassies reopened and diplomatic ties restored. So, surely, it's a time to be optimistic, especially for Eritreans, we'd expect. But critics of the country have called it a one-man dictatorship, and the UN has accused the government of crimes against humanity. But some hope that this peace deal could be the first step on the path to reform. For more, here's Natalie Pahonen with this special report from Addis Abeba. Across Addis Ababa, the scent of coffee rises in the morning. Stands like Makta Fitwis can be found all over Ethiopia and in neighbouring Eritrea. That's where Makta's from. She fled four years ago. <laughs> When Makta crossed the border, the countries were still at war. Now, plenty of coffee shop conversations are about peace. Because earlier this year, Abi Ahmed became Ethiopia's prime minister. Since 1998, Eritrea and Ethiopia had been in a no-war, no-peace deadlock after a border dispute. That conflict led to the deaths of about 80,000 people and to both sides cutting ties with each other. Eritrea became a reclusive state and maintained a large army. In June, Abiy Ahmed announced Ethiopia would fully accept and implement a peace agreement that was originally signed in 2000 extending an olive branch to Eritrea's president, Isaias Afwerki. Once bitter rivals have become seemingly fast friends. Here's Isaias speaking in Amharic, the official language of Ethiopia. This is not just a story of leaders coming together, but of families reuniting. Flights have resumed between the countries. One of the first to fly from Addis Ababa to Asmara was Ethiopian journalist Adi Salam Haggu. He was reunited with his two daughters and his Eritrean wife for the first time in 16 years. He is still overcome recalling that moment. I can't tell you how, you know. It was not only the dream of Adisalem, but the dream of every Ethiopian and Eritrean uh, to face such condition. I was crying with my last energy, but it was a tear of happiness. It was not a tear of sorrow. He's only been able to visit his family once since the borders reopened. 
He wants to bring his daughters, Clara and Danait, back to Ethiopia. It's a very beautiful, I, I, I'll show you. But, you know, only the skin is there. Therefore, I can easily understand how hard, how tough the life is. Of course, Eritrea as a country is suffering a lot, diplomatically and economically. And my children, my daughters also share this problem. There's, there's, there is no a different room for my own children. And that's what most Eritreans are experiencing in life. Since the peace deal signing in July, one of the big questions has been whether Eritrea will follow the path of its neighbour and seek political and social reforms. Asmara had used the hostility between the two nations as a justification for indefinite military service. But that could be about to change. Eritrea's government says it's now considering cutting the size of its army. Analysts say it's just one example of how the rapprochement could change the country. The peace will take away the justification for the conscription. But beyond that, I believe the uh, now a lot of Ethiopians are traveling to Eritrea. Some, some Eritreans are traveling to Ethiopia. And with this freedom of movement of people, there is also freedom of movement of ideas to some extent. But there are no guarantees in this period of peace. Eritrea remains a one-party state under one-man rule. Abebe Teklehamanot was commander-in-chief of Ethiopia's air force during the border war. He says Abi and Isaias are in a honeymoon phase. Until now, it's more or less uh, a relationship between uh, leaders. This has to be institutionalized. There should be uh, 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 people engaged, especially experts on economic, political, uh, diplomatic, security, and all this. They have to study the impact, then bring some kind of a re uh, roadmap. Back at her coffee stand, Makta is watching the political developments closely. But like many Eritreans, until she's certain there are lasting changes at home, she'll be staying in Ethiopia. Natalie Pohonen in Addis Ababa for the Newsmakers. Now, to discuss this, we're joined from Brussels by Collins Henweke. He's an African affairs analyst. And from Leiden in the Netherlands, we have Daniel McConan, and he's the executive director of the Eritrean Law Society. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us on The Newsmakers. Now, I want to start by saying that from here, from the outside, this peace deal looks like possibly one of the most amazing peace deals in decades. Uh, flights have resumed, embassies have opened, and communication lines have, uh, have been established again. Now, is this just a facade or, you know, what really needs to happen in the next six to 12 months for this really to work? And I'll put this first to you, Collins. Well, um, you've uh, captured the um, short-term uh, gains of uh, this peace deal uh, pretty well. Another aspect of it, of course, uh, for the everyday man, is the fact that um, families have, uh, you know, reunited. Now, I do not know where the cynicism comes from, uh, but you will note that... Um, there are individuals and, of course, uh, countries that uh, actually benefited from, um, you know, the uh, the conflict as it lasted. So, if the cynicisms are coming from them, it is well uh, understood. But for the vast majority of uh, the people of Ethiopia and um, Eritrea, I think um, uh, this is the best uh, gift of the century that mm. uh, they can have. Okay. Now... Uh, the two leaders need to be commended and encouraged from all quarters to, uh, you know, keep up the peace and uh, just keep uh, tinkering on.
Okay. And Daniel, do you agree that this is the best gift of the century? Everyone, everyone uh, would like to have peace. Uh, so there is no question about that. It's good that the two governments have finally the, uh, came to, the, to their senses and they have started a new peace process. But since the beginning of this process, we have been expressing concerns, concerns in particular on the side of Eritrea. But now, as we have seen from last, year, from last month, including the beginning of this month, there are even some uh, worrying signs coming in from Ethiopia. Uh, we need to remember that, you know, the absence of armed conflict between two countries alone does not come as something of peace. Those countries, both countries need to be at peace with themselves in their own internal political processes. And if I, if I give you some recent figures and reports of recent times from Ethiopia, there are very, very uh, worrying signs since the the new prime minister came to power in April. United Nations agencies are telling us there are close to one million people displaced in Ethiopia because of ethnic-based violence. Just last Friday, there has been um, an, another incident of ethnic-based violence in Western Ethiopia in which 40 people have been said killed uh, in the conflict and more than 70,000 Seventy thousand people have also been displaced. Okay. So if you if you look into these latest developments, they don't come in 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 in, in you, you cannot reconcile them mm -hmm. with the sense of optimism we have observed at the very few uh, initial few months, two or three months since the new prime minister, prime minister came to power. But if you look into Eritrea, the problem is actually much worse, much worse in the sense that there is no sense of responsibility on the part of the Eritrean government in terms of opening up the political space. So what I would like to, to make, uh, to say here is, it's good, the good that the governments have now peace between, in, in their bilateral relations, but they, only, they also need to make peace with their own people at home. And then only then they can say this uh, new initiative will have okay, a um, lasting... Yes. Continue, sorry yeah. to have interrupted you. Can, can you finish your point? Daniel? Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. And as far as Eritrea is concerned, we, we need to remember the government should now come up with a plan on how to implement the, the, the long overdue political transformation of the country. Remember, this is a country which is ruled without a constitution, without any form of parliament. In relatively speaking, Ethiopia is much better in some aspects of these issues I'm discussing now. But Eritrea is completely a different, mm -hmm. a different well, it's case. Let's hope, let's hope the new process may have its own spillover effect on a gradual basis, which we can only assess and evaluate okay. with time. But as we see it now, things are still, nothing has changed in Eritrea as far as the internal political process is concerned. But I'm sure, you know, these are very early days and I, I want to, uh, to come back and look at um, Eritrea in more, more detail. Um, but I just want to capture you know, what needs to really happen, because we've seen peace before. Um, just how fragile is this peace deal? And is it more than just, like you mentioned, you know, good bilateral relations, or do we now need to really institutionalize uh, those, that, that goodwill? To you, please, Collins. Uh, yes. Okay. Um, yes, indeed, Daniel has... Um captured uh, the preliminary challenges uh, facing this hard-end um, peace. Um, of course, everyone will agree, I mean, despite the figures that um, uh, Daniel uh, gave us and on the assumption that those figures are correct, that uh, the situation as it is today, no matter how little, uh, is an improvement of the situation as uh, they were um, yesterday. Now, we can only build on it, and how do we build on, um, you know, the peace agreement that has, uh, you know, uh, been, um, uh, that has been agreed? Uh, number one, um, there need to be an implementation plan on both sides. And I think it is important that um, international bodies, more importantly, the African Union, uh, needs to play a very, very important and, uh, you know, strategic role in keeping this uh, fragile peace as it is today, starting with uh, the implementation plan that both countries have to put on the table, 
I think it is important that when that has happened, that um, a standing uh, mediation team will remain in both countries and uh, indeed ensure that um, whatever is agreed as the implementation is followed through to a uh, conclusion. Now, another very important aspect that I believe um, should not be uh, ignored is, um, you know, the arrangement uh, to put back, um, you know, the, the countries, especially uh, Eritrea, in the uh, intergovernmental um, authority on, on, uh, on development. I believe that uh, that move needs to be um, heightened and uh, made to happen as quickly as what possible. What do you mean because exactly by that? What I mean by that is that uh, part of um, part of the uh, deal um, in terms of the agreement reached is uh, the fact that um, you know the uh, Eritrea needs to be um, you know brought back to the fold of the intergovernmental authority on uh, on development. Okay. Now uh, it is an international agreement that has uh, quite uh, you know far-reaching obligations. And once they sign up to it, and there are very many reasons why they should um, okay. sign up for it, both for social, economic, uh, and uh, otherwise. And so once they sign up for it, I believe that living up to the uh, expectations of um, the agreement will also help to contribute uh, to, you know, sustaining the peace, the fragile peace that has so far been um, uh, agreed. Okay. And, and Daniel, your thoughts on this point? Yeah, I... I... In, I agree with some of the observations made by Collins in, in for example, the need uh, for Eritrea to rejoin uh, IGAD, the Intergovernmental Agency for Development for the whole of Africa countries. More than that, however, I, 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 I would like to focus on the need to strengthen national institutions. There has to be a move on, on, on both sides. At least Ethiopia have started this mm -hmm. kind of move. I, of course, the Prime Minister have taken very bold measures, including by inviting the most radical armed groups which were in exile, have been invited to Ethiopia. We have seen last month the coming back of the Oromo Liberation Movement to Ethiopia. Uh, this was one of the armed groups which were fighting. Of course, it was based in, in Eritrea. We, don't need, we also need to remember that. Um, and this will help, I would say, in my assumption, in transforming the political process in Ethiopia. So Ethiopia has already started taking meaningful steps. It doesn't mean these are enough. It doesn't mean these are sufficient, but there is at least a signal or a sign on the part of the, the new government in Ethiopia. We don't okay. see this in, in, in Eritrea. These are my concerns. So my, my point is uh, the national institutions, the institutions that support democratic accountability, the institutions that support transparent transparency uh, in all in both countries they need to be nurtured in in cases where such institutions do not exist they need to be uh, re-established or established as soon as possible because uh, the, the, this ongoing peace process it needs supporting institutions it has to be institutionalized basically that's the core of the the, the, okay. uh, the argument okay. I'm trying to make here so we don't see that on on both sides on an equal uh, footing. That's why I actually believe this peace process is happening in a relationship which can be described as asymmetrical. There is an imbalance of, um, uh, of, of the essential requirements of democratic accountability in both countries. And I hope, I hope, I very much hope that this will be addressed by both governments sooner than later. Okay. Uh, very interesting points you both made there. Um, now, I just want to ask about outside influences. Of course, you mentioned the African Union and um, bringing in um, other international um, institutions. But first of all, explain why the US, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates were involved in this peace deal. What's in stake, uh, the stake there, the interest for these three countries, brokering peace between two African countries? Now, um, I mean, it goes without saying that um, uh, there is peace agreed between two countries, uh, Ethiopia and uh, Eritrea, but uh, we need to understand very clearly that the impact of the peace between these two countries 
uh, is going to resonate uh, far beyond the two countries, uh, you know, encompassing the entire horns of, uh, of Africa. Now, you know as well that um, terrorism uh, is um, a very serious, uh, you know, challenge of, uh, of this day and age. Uh, we do know the activities of uh, Al-Shabaab, among uh, other terrorist organizations, that uh, it has become a borderless uh, phenomenon, mm -hmm. going as far back to uh, Europe, uh, America, and, uh, you know, the uh, Arab uh, countries. So... Uh, it becomes everyone's uh, business. So, I mean, it is not rocket science indeed that uh, America, Europe, and, uh, you know, the rest of uh, the um, civilized world uh, has interest in this, um, you know, peace deal and uh, are helping to, uh, to facilitate it and to make it uh, stick. I, I believe uh, more should be done uh, intergovernmentally to, um, you know, uh, sustain this peace. Okay. And uh, your yeah. thoughts, uh, Daniel, on this point? What we know from, uh, from the past few months is that, yes, the governments of Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates are actually very much involved in this peace process. Uh, both governments have invited the president of Eritrea and the prime minister of Ethiopia to really acknowledge the, their um, willingness to... Um, accept this new peace proposal, which, which was previously reported as being promoted behind the scenes by, by these two governments. So finally, uh, since we have seen the, the official um, uh, ceremony of um, uh, awarding both leaders in, 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 okay. in those respective countries, that now we know there has been involvement of both. I'm not sure if there has been uh, any role of the United Nations uh, States of America behind the scenes, maybe, yes. But let me explain why... If you could <clears> very <throat> briefly, Daniel, because we're, we're running <clears throat> out of time. Okay. I, will do it short. I will do it in one minute. The reason why the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia are involved in this peace process is actually they are using the port of Assad, their military base, as a, as a temporary or long-term military base for their military operations in Yemen. So it's important for them to have peace between Eritrea and Ethiopia in order for them to be able to use the facilities at the port of Assad. This is one of several factors, but in my understanding, in my understanding, this is the reason why they're actively involved in this process. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, you know, we're going to have to leave it there. We we're just getting to a, a, a very uh, interesting part. Um, Collins and work here, thank you very much. And also Daniel uh, McConnell, both of you, Thank you very much for joining us on The Newsmakers and we wish uh, peace for both uh, Ethiopia and Eritrea. Thank you. So to come on the programme, after a blunt exchange between Imran Khan and Narendra Modi, we ask if relations between Pakistan and India are getting worse. And could the Bitcoin bubble be about to burst or has it already happened? When Imran Khan became Pakistan's prime minister, there were hopes that ties with India were about to improve. The first high-level talks in years were scheduled between the two countries' leaders, but they were quickly scrapped. The tension between them has soared, with Khan calling Modi a small man occupying a big office. So is there any chance of a rapprochement between India and Pakistan, or will relations only worsen under Khan? For more, here's Haider Abbasi. A day after India agreed to talks with its rival and neighbour Pakistan, New Delhi made this announcement. Now, it is obvious that behind Pakistan's proposal for talks to make a fresh beginning, the evil agenda of Pakistan stands exposed. And it didn't take long for Pakistan to respond in kind. Prime Minister Imran Khan wrote this on Twitter. And it was looking so optimistic. The nuclear-armed nations haven't spoken since 2007. 
But in his speech after being elected in July, Pakistan's Khan said he was ready to improve ties with India. So they agreed that their foreign ministers would talk at the UN General Assembly, which took place last month. But that small window of opportunity was slammed shut. So how did it go so wrong so quickly? India says three of its policemen were killed by rebels in its Kashmir region just after the UN talks were agreed upon. New Delhi accuses Pakistan's military of arming and training the insurgents. Islamabad denies this. But Kashmir has been the main dispute between the neighbours since the partition of India and creation of Pakistan in 1947. Both sides claim the territory as their own. The region was split in 1949 after the end of the first war between the nations. One half is administered by Pakistan and the other by India. The area controlled by India has a Muslim majority and there's been a rise in opposition to Indian rule there. Pakistan and India fought two more wars over Kashmir in 1965 and 1999. More recently, India was also annoyed by the publication of a series of stamps in Pakistan. They commemorate what Islamabad calls atrocities in Indian-occupied Kashmir. One features the Kashmiri rebel commander Burhan Wani. On the stamp, he's called a freedom icon. The 22-year-old Wani was killed by Indian forces in 2016. His death triggered mass protest in the region. New Delhi says Pakistan is glorifying terrorism. Islamabad rejects this. So, instead of peaceful diplomacy at the UN headquarters in New York, there was this. Pakistan glorifies killers. It refuses to see the blood of innocents. It's a matter of concern for the international community that India has sponsored terrorism and aggression against all its neighbours. But analysts say India is acting tough because it's holding an election next year. The ruling BJP is a Hindu nationalist party that's gained popularity through its opposition to Pakistan. So was the call for talks too much too soon for Imran Khan? Haida Abbasi, The Newsmakers. Now let's bring in our panel and joining me now is Shazad Chowdhury from Islamabad and he's a security analyst and former Air Vice Marshal in the Pakistani Air Force. And in New Delhi is Ashok Behuria and he's a senior fellow at the South Asia Centre of the Institute for Defence Studies and Analysis. And completing our panel from the Indian capital is Syed Zafar Islam and he's a spokesman for the ruling Bharatiya Janata Party, or otherwise known as the BJP for short. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us here on The Newsmakers. Now, I want to pick up on a question that was asked by uh, my colleague in the package that we just uh, ran. The question, and I want to put this to uh, Mr. Chowdhury first, was the call for talks with India by Imran Khan too much too soon for Pakistan's Imran Khan? No, I don't think so. I think it was rightly timed. It was a change of government in Pakistan. And unfortunately, for the last uh, at least four years or five years, India and Pakistan had not been uh, in communication uh, formally and officially in terms of uh, trying to work problems out. So it was... Uh, imagined at least uh, within Pakistan and I'm sure to certain people in India as well that uh, Imran Khan, a new government, uh, on, in a, on a better sort of uh, uh, coordination with the army, on supported by the army, on a better page and better understanding with them, uh, should be able to forward the agenda of peace with India. And therefore, the, uh, uh, the initiative that he took or his government took was well-timed. Uh, also, please keep in mind that it, it was in response to uh, Mr. Narendra Modi's very uh, generous uh, letter of uh, felicitations as well as uh, the High Commissioner bringing in a cricket bat signed by the entire cricket team on behalf of the Indian government because our mm -hmm. uh, Prime Minister Imran Khan is a former cricketer recognized as such. So I think these were good signs to begin with and therefore in response Imran was to take that important step of 
uh, suggesting that the two sides need to begin to at least talk to each other, if not formally, then at least informally at certain places, and see if there's a possibility to work things through. So I think in that sense, it was very well-timed, very welcomed in Pakistan, and very popular and supported in Pakistan. So with all this goodwill, good timing like th that you've mentioned, and, and support from Pakistan, why did it not work out? And that question to uh, you, Mr. Zaid Safar. Well, you have to understand everything in the right perspective. India is a peace-loving country, and they have always advocated peace. But unfortunately, Pakistan is a country which is harboring terrorism, which is actually giving a lot of support to terrorist organizations, logistical support to terrorist organizations. Okay. By the um, United Nations, yes. Okay. Pakistan is not taking action against those people. Okay, okay. I want so, to, your your, your we, line isn't want, very clear, want, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Zafar. I'm I'm tr I'm struggling to hear you. I just want to bring in uh, Dr. Ashok while uh, we check your line. Your your comments on um, why this goodwill gesture, let's say, by Imran Khan to restart talks with uh, with India, didn't get off to a good start. You see, Imran knows India much better than anyone else in the political domain at the moment. He was the one, as a cricketer, he has been here. As a commentator, he has been here. As a politician, he has been here. So I, I think, you know, there was no want of intention. But the problem is, the path to hell is always paved with good intentions. Uh, when he uh, came out with his measures of peace, so there was some kind of a disbelief uh, in India and elsewhere. Uh, but people thought that it was good because there was a, a realization that uh, this is somebody, this, this leader is somebody who has been, uh, he, who enjoys the support of the army, as Air Marshal said. And uh, so it could be acted upon, it could be responded to. And that is how the Prime Minister of India had uh, sent in those messages. Mm -hmm. And it was followed by those exchange of cricket bat and things like that. Okay. And there was also there was also receptivity from India that we will talk to uh, uh, the, the foreign ministers will talk uh, on the sidelines of the United Nations General Assembly meet. But what really acted as a spoil sport, which has been acting as a spoil sport from 2008 onwards, is uh, the attack on BSF uh, guys and the allegation of mutilation of one of the uh, soldiers. Uh, every time such things happen, the spoilers have a free run. And uh, India-Pakistan relationship is uh, entirely spoiler-driven. Okay. Uh, so both the, both the leadership will have to decide how to rein in these spoilers, how to control uh, these spoil acts. Okay. Uh, and by to spoilers, be able you, to create, you mean... Um, Dr. Ashok, I just want to clarify. By spoilers, you mean terrorists? Is the that... non -state, yeah, yes, yes. The non-state actors, uh, otherwise called militants, uh, they are called freedom fighters in Pakistan. Uh, but the fact that, you know, it cannot be denied that they are coming from across the LOC or international border and okay. creating um, a situation which, uh, which is providing uh, an opportunity for okay. the, 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 the militancy you, to grow. Okay, but that has been going on for a long time. Um, and here at the UN, um, there was an opportunity to speak on the sidelines of this event by the foreign ministers of uh, India and Pakistan, and they didn't. Um, why exactly didn't they? And also, aren't they you know, jeopardizing here a chance for dialogue. They always say we should, you know, have dialogue. Let me, let me get back to, you know, the theme. You know, in 2014, when the government came to power, this government came to power, a right-wing government, uh, then they also started uh, toying with the idea of restarting the dialogue. And anybody in Pakistan uh, who uh, follows India-Pakistan relations would know the sensitivity of this government to terrorism, to, to militancy. And uh, the first attempt uh, by both the governments to restart the talk was cancelled because the Pakistani embassy in Delhi had invited um, separatist groups. 
who advocate, who support militancy quietly. And this sensitivity should be factored into any attempt to restart the dialogue from uh, both the sides, okay. and especially from Pakistan. And what, what really troubles me is the fact that from 2008 onwards, whenever there has been an opportunity for a start of dialogue, you have all these things coming up. In fact, the, the, the current foreign minister of Pakistan, Mr. Saw Mahmood Kuresi, was in the capital city of India when Mumbai took place, Mumbai attack took place. And okay. the spoilers had spoilers had timed it to perfection. Do Dr. And since Ashab, then, I, I, that's a, you know, a very valid point you're, you're making. It's going very much into the past, um, but a very good point. I want to bring in um, Zaid Zafar. Um, we were just talking about the opportunity um, for the foreign ministers of India and Pakistan to have met in uh, on the sidelines of the UN General Assembly in New York recently, and. That meeting was cancelled. Why did India cancel that meeting? And that's to you, Mr. Zafar. Well, you, well, you have to see what Pakistan did. We agreed for this meeting when the request came from the Pakistani Prime Minister. We agreed that the two foreign ministers must meet. Okay, we seem to have lost uh, Zayed Zafar. Now, um, I want to bring you in, Mr. Chowdhury, and, and ask... Where do relations uh, between India and Pakistan stand now, given the fact that, OK, we've had this, um, this meeting cancelled um, at the UN and um, other developments, which include um, Imran Khan's tweet, and I will uh, read it. Um, Imran Khan called um, the Prime Minister of India, Narendra Modi, a small man in a big office. Um, how has that influenced relations now between India and Pakistan? Well, let me, let me clarify. I don't think he meant what you were trying to imply or what is generally being implied of that tweet, but I'll come to that later. Uh, first to your other bigger point, which is in terms of what is the future of India-Pakistan relations. Now, we need got to understand, and of course, the entire South Asia knows that very well, this, these problems are not of the recent times or the recent couple of decades or something. These problems start 70 years back since Pakistan and India became independent. We have an unresolved baggage that we carry with ourselves, and the impact and the effect of it continues even today in Kashmir. I hate to mention that, but in fact, that is the sore point, the sore problem, the core issue between the two countries, which stands unresolved. 100,000 Kashmiris have been killed, and there's almost a genocide going on in Kashmir at this point of time. So because of that, there have been wars between India and Pakistan. There's been this um, uh, lack of amicability between both sides. We've made attempts to try and uh, start a dialogue and have not gone anywhere and have not come to uh, grips with our problems. So obviously, with the narrative that you hear from Delhi and the narrative that Pakistan will tell you, there is impossibility of any convergence. Convergence should exist, does exist, but it, it, it must be outside of these two narratives. And neither the official spokespersons, nor the media, nor the nationalistic uh, fervor on both sides, nor the statesmanship or the leadership on any side has yet got the capacity or the ability to come out of the narrative that they feed to the people through the media, feed to international media through, the, through, through such kind of discussions, and are unable to rise beyond or above the, kind, the, the level that they're sitting at. And this is exactly what Imran Khan meant. Imran Khan meant that let's, let's imagine and let's assume that there are bad elements on both sides who do not want India and Pakistan to break through out of this particular uh, uh, level of relationship. So, so where, where does the political leadership begin to count? Where does the foreign ministers, the minister, the cabinets and the leaderships should begin to count? And that is where they must rise above where they are, like Vajpayee did. I think Vajpayee did a great job in moving to Pakistan and initiating the contact with Pakistan. These problems will continue to occur, okay. but the political leadership must be bold enough, big enough, brave enough, with a heart which should be equally large and big to be to rise above this, fail these elements, and ensure the dialogue continues. When you don't continue the dialogue, don't meet up with any with each other, then you feed the same kind of elements that are holding but you back, regardless of them by any name. But uh, Mr. Chowdhury, it's a failure. I, 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 
I call it a failure. Actually, I call it a failure. It's a, it's a crass failure of uh, political imagination uh, in India. And, and so that meeting, potential meeting at the, the UN and also Imran Khan's call for, for dialogue, a failure? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Not, not, not a failure of calling for a dialogue. No, no. The failure to respond to, to, respond to those absolutely. things is a failure. The failure to respond to such requests or, or the ability or the, or, or the opportunity to meet together is a failure. Yeah. It's a combined failure of South Asia. Unfortunately, largely held on to the kind of comments that you are now getting from uh, the other side. And uh, Dr. Ashok, do you agree? Well, you know, I would... Uh, I will go back to what uh, Air Marshal Choudhury said. Uh, he, was, uh, he was right. 2004 to 2007, we had a wonderful round of dialogue between the two states. And in fact, as a result of which, you have uh, this cross LOC travel and trade in place, and which has not uh, been interrupted by these uh, years of uh, uh, no, the two countries not talking to each other. So that is a fantastic thing. But why it happened uh, in 2004? It was not only the large heartedness of um, uh, Mr. Bajpayee, but it was also in equal measure the decision of uh, the, the then military administration in. Uh, or military dispensation in Islamabad to sincerely try to rein in the terror elements. Okay. And uh, poor, poor Musarab had been attacked thrice because of this. Okay. But he suffered it all and came out with some formula Dr. on Ashok, the basis of which... I'm sorry to interrupt. We we're running out of time. But I just want you to answer well, um, now, in 2018, um, India has elections coming hmm. up. Do you think that India is being particularly harsh on Pakistan because of these elections coming up? No, no, no. I, I tend to believe uh, that, you know, elections or no elections, uh, the, the kind of stand that the government has taken, they would have behaved exactly in the same manner. So election, uh, people have said in Pakistan, I am following the media, they're saying that you know, it is because of, the, because of the elections, Modi behaved the way he did. Well, if it were so, he wouldn't have sent the uh, envoy to meet Imran Khan. But he did this. And I, I beg to differ with uh, Mr. Choudhury that uh, the, the, this present generation of leadership is no, no, not large-headed. I think Modi, in the heart of hearts, has tried. We must give credit to him for having gone to Lahore to meet Mr. Nawaz Sarif. He also had uh, quiet discussion with him in Kathmandu. But the problem is there is a kind of there a are, yeah. uh, that, that there is a kind of a what do you say? Uh, there are the connotations to that, Mr. Islamabad, Islamabad, yeah. Islamabad, Islamabad. Yes. Islamabad. Yeah. So I, I would say I would say, Mr. Choudhury, I would say that you know there is a need to also reflect on the spoiler element on both the sides, whether spoilers should be but given have, a chance to interrupt look, these processes. All I'm saying is. All I'm saying is that you have the most densely populated, militarily populated border line of control in Kashmir on both sides. How is it possible, and after Pakistan has showed you in 2003, how is it possible that anybody from Pakistan can still manage to go in and do what you're doing to the Kashmiris or in response to that support them? I think your problems lie within your own borders or within the LOC on your side. Till the time that you're able to resolve that, till the time that you're able to bring calm there Mr. and bring about a sense of peace. I don't think that you, your problems within your own borders will come to an end. So please don't try and blame that on us. <laughs> we feel here in Pakistan that you are transferring the blame of your political failures, of, your, of, your, of the lack of religious sensitivity within Mr. India Chaudhary, on Pakistan. Us, and, let, that is why, him, and, and that is why, and that is why, that is why you continue to, be, continue to be in a state that we are in. I think we need to change the way we think, and we need our leaders need, surely need to be beyond that so that we can get on to a more peaceful future. Dr. So, Shok, your comments? So where, 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 where do you differ? I'm just saying that the leaders have to go beyond, you know, the yeah. present uh, line of thinking. Line of thinking. Absolutely. So I am not. I'm. I'm saying that you know to to underestimate the capacity of external agencies interfering in internal affairs of other countries. Would be, it would be, it would not be, 
would not be doing justice to the process. We have to, because I told you, in 2004, 2007, it happened and it went look, on for three hours, look, three we have, years. Because, look, because, because, gentlemen, we, we are, I'm going we to are, interrupt because we, we have... The, a, we are the direct... Because, sorry. Mr. Chari, sorry because to because interrupt. Because, we have two uh, minutes left. I just want because, very quickly, uh, um, Dr. Ashok, from both of you, to, we need to finish our segment. Tell us, can um, relations between India and Pakistan improve or are they just going to get worse? Very quickly, in, in 30 seconds, Mr. Chowdhury, first of all. No, I'm sure. I'm sure that we can, we can get on. Like I said, there are convergences outside the two narratives that are peddled in the both nations and we need to look beyond those uh, narratives for the moment. If India can forget and harping onto the terrorism only, for which Pakistan is now as much a target. We remember we have Kalbushan Yadav with us, right here in Pakistan, as an Indian, Indian naval commander who was doing espionage and terrorism in Pakistan. So obviously we have a living proof of that. So we are as much a target now as India claims itself to be. We need to go beyond that. Even if you have terrorism as a problem, you still need to sit down and talk to each other to mitigate it, minimize it, and eliminate it. Okay. And... Uh... On that note, we're going to have to end. Um, I want to thank uh, our guests. Uh, thank you very much for speaking to us on The Newsmakers. Thank you all. Once the futures trading of Bitcoin starts and institutional investors come in, it may be an assurance that the currency is considered as a subject of investment in the financial system. Then we may say that virtual currencies, or Bitcoin, are now a well-recognized target of investment. Now, owning Bitcoin is a lot like being on a roller coaster. The cryptocurrency has seen several dramatic rises and falls, which is probably why some, including the legendary investor Warren Buffett, have warned people to stay away from it. But despite its volatility, some still see it as the future of finance. The U.S. Securities Exchange Commission has so far rejected approving the first exchange-traded fund for cryptocurrencies. But that could change by the end of the year. So is the future looking bright for Bitcoin or is the bubble about to burst? Well, to find out more, let's go to Daniele Bianchi, and he's an assistant professor in the finance group at Warwick Business School. Thanks for, so much for joining us, Daniele. So what do you think? Is Bitcoin about to burst? Uh, well, somebody would say that actually the bubble already burst because if you look at the, the price about a year ago, so back in December 2017, uh, we were talking about twenty thousand uh, dollars for a bitcoin, and now we're talking about about six thousand dollars for a bitcoin, which is obviously far more than the original price of bitcoin per se. But um, uh, I think to some extent we can actually say that the bubble already burst, or at least is on a, the price is on a downward trajectory, uh, definitely. Mm -hmm. Now there was so much hope, so many people investing. What went so wrong? Why is it now at this stage? Um, I think the main reason is that uh, Bitcoin is still uh, doesn't have really attraction in terms of uh, uh, both being a method of payment uh, is still not widely used. Um, and the, the, the other side of the story is that it's not widely used as an investment per se, um, uh, which uh, basically um, prevents him to be widely diffused. Uh, and therefore, I mean, th th there is no really value uh, in it so far, uh, it's not it's not so diffused that uh, the people can really believe that it's a viable investment instrument for retails, especially uh, as well as a method of payment. Okay, I think that, that that's the underlying story. Now, could this all change though, depending on the uh, the U.S. Uh, securities decision? I think we had a long way to get the, the ATF approved. Uh, people talk about 2019. I'm a bit skeptical. Uh, I, I don't think we're going to see any ETF on Bitcoin over the next, you know, at least six months or so, uh, let alone ATF that tracks the whole cryptocurrency market. I think that would be very, very far away. And obviously, I mean, without ATF, you don't really have very liquid uh, and, and low and cheap instrument to trade Bitcoin per se, which again is going to probably affect the, 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 the price of Bitcoin in the, in the next future as well. Okay. So Warren Buffett, a man that knows a lot about what to do in, uh, with, with his money, he's saying stay away. So you agree with this? 
Uh, I think uh, you, you can invest in Bitcoin if you're willing to take the risk, but uh, not certainly if you're a retail investor, I guess. All right. Well, um, and your final thoughts then for, uh, for people that have put a lot of money into Bitcoin already. What happens there? Uh, well, uh, I don't want to give any investment recommendation, obviously. Uh, but, um, I mean, it's, as I said, it's really up to them. I mean, the, the, the important thing is that people understand that this is a very risky asset class. Uh, and then, I mean, if, as I said, if you're willing to take the risk, uh, go for it. If not, you know, act accordingly. Okay. And um, the one thing that I want you to clarify was um, the fact that actually mining the Bitcoin and the electricity for this, one of the big things that people missed and, and misunderstood with Bitcoin. Uh, I mean, mine, the whole mining process is very expensive. So um, if you, which again prevents uh, all of these things factoring uh, in the, the, the adoption, the widely diffusion and adoption of Bitcoin, but other cryptocurrencies as well because the, 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 the mining procedure actually, it's very similar for other cryptocurrencies as well. Uh, so mining and the energy that you need for mining, the costs that are involved for mining, the GPU um, that are involved for mining, it's, it's, as you said correctly, it's an aspect that people don't normally look at, but I think it's an aspect that, you know, it's, it's already waiting in the, the, the adoption and the diffusion of, of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies as well. All right, we'll have to leave it there then. Daniela Bianchi, thank you so much for joining us Thanks here for having me. on The Newsmakers. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. That's all from this edition of The Newsmakers with me, Maria Ramos. Now, do check out more of our stories on YouTube, Facebook and Twitter. And remember to like, follow and subscribe. And next time we bring you a special show from the TRT World Forum where we challenge leaders and global thinkers on how to bring peace and security to a fragmented world. Until then, thanks for watching and goodbye.